Good afternoon. Welcome to the regular Friday meeting of the City Club of Portland. I'm Jim Westwood, your president. I want to introduce new members in the audience today, the lifeblood of our club, and uh, please hold your applause until I've introduced all of the new members, and I'd ask each new member to stand as I I mentioned your name. First, Robert Imstad, Stormwater Program Manager for the Bureau of Envi Environmental Services of the City of Portland. And if you've been reading the papers, that's an important job. Uh, Robert Friedman, Director of the Portland Center for the Performing Arts. Jonathan Greenstein, Retail Property Specialist with Melvin Mark Brokerage Company. Rhoda Harwood, Area Sales Manager, The Travel Difference at Myron Frank. Mark Kriegbaum, an accountant with Charles Nolan and Company and Milton Lehman, Chairman of Vital Choice. Welcome all of you to City Club. <laughs> Thanks also to City Club member recruiters, Martha Boucher, Linda McPherson, and Mary Ann Normandon. On your tables, you'll notice there is a form that I invite each of you members to, uh, to put your name and daytime phone number on for City Club's uh, mentoring program for new members. I think it's dreadfully important that we get new members involved in City Club and show them that this is not a stuffy outfit where you'll never be able to get involved yourself. And one of the best ways we can do that is to have City Club members act as mentors for these new members one-on-one. -on -one. Bring them to a Friday luncheon or two, uh, bring them to a committee meeting, or some other City Club function, and just be around to help these people get to know the ropes at City Club. So on your tables, I invite each of you members to put your name and your daytime phone number so that you can be contacted by City Club and, and matched up with a new City Club member. Next Wednesday, November 20th, the Science Breakfast is sponsored by the Science and High Technology Standing Committee, and it presents Glenn Kays, a certified prosthetist of the, at the Oregon Health Sciences University. Mr. Kays will talk about high-tech advancements in artificial limbs. That's at the Port Portland Hilton, parlors A, B, and C in the ballroom level. Please call Cindy Lehman at the club office to make your reservation. Reservations are required for the science breakfast next Wednesday, November 20. Next Friday, November 22nd, William Strickland, Jr., a council member of the National Endowment for the Arts, will speak on Across the Spectrum, Building Stability in the Arts. Mr. Strickland is a national spokesman on strategies for building programs for building stability in arts organizations, and he'll talk about successful programs that he directs and share his perspective on developing long-term funding for the arts. This program next Friday is co-sponsored by Portland's Arts Plan 2000. You'll notice in this week's bulletin that beginning on Friday, December 1st, luncheon prices for our City Club programs increase to $11 for members and $15 for guests. I, am, I regret the increase, but the increase is prompted by rising costs at the Benson and Hilton hotels, and this is the first increase in club luncheon prices in three years. A special holiday idea for your City Club friends or prospective new members is our City Club mug. Coffee mugs are sa on sale today without coffee in them, I believe, at the back of the room, and at the end of the program, they'll be available also in weeks to come. Please take advantage of this opportunity to support the club and your friends at the same time. Mugs are also available at the club's, op club's office. Our board host today, seated at the head table, is Ross Simmons, a member of the Board of Governors and environmental consultant with SRH Associates Incorporated. He will have the privilege of asking the first question of today's speaker. The second question will be asked by Brian Campbell, a member of the City Club Standing Committee on Land Use and Transportation. After that, as always, we open up the meeting to questions from the audience, microphones at the floor. You can line up in advance if you want to as soon as the microphone's there. Um, members only, please, asking questions. Written questions will be asked as time permits, and also on your table are forms for the written questions. Please hold them up so that staff can bring them up to the head table at the close of our speaker's comments. Those of you who have seen the crumbling turnpikes and the dilapidated transit systems of the northeastern United States may have seen the face of tomorrow for the Pacific Northwest. The glitzy new high-rises and the shining suburbs in the Northwest and around the rest of the country mask an ugly fact that the infrastructure of roads, pipes, and wires that holds the social fabric of this country together is aging and needs major repairs right away. But with ongoing demands for public funding, for education, various entitlements, financial institution insurance bailouts, and yes, even more so these days, interest on the national debt, 
What's left for that age-old federal funding sink, the National Transportation Links? Well, there seems to be $151 billion in the offing under a Highway and Mass Transit Bill drafted by the Surface Transportation Subcommittee of the House Committee on Public Works and Transportation. About half a billion dollars of that in that bill is earmarked for the Multnomah Washington County West Side Light Rail Project, and a host of other Oregon highway projects are included in the bill. One of the bill's authors is Representative Peter DeFazio of Oregon's 4th Congressional District, our guest today. Representative DeFazio is a Massachusetts native who graduated from Tufts University in 1969, came to Oregon for the first time to go to graduate school in that same year, and stayed on. From 1977 to 1982, he was on the staff of his predecessor, Representative Jim Weaver. Then he served on the board of Lane County Commissioners, chairing that for a year, shortly before his 1986 election to Congress, where he is now serving his third term. And those of you who are familiar with the unusual politics of the 4th Congressional District will agree that three terms is a minor miracle for a congressman from the 4th District. Representative DeFazio also serves on the House Interior and Insular Affairs Committee and the House Select Committee on Aging, but today he's here to discuss America's transportation systems and perhaps to tell us where that $151 billion is coming from. So I present to you now Representative Peter DeFazio. You know, I went, uh, I was telling some folks at the head table that uh, when I first went to, to Congress, uh, the, the, the uh, process for getting on committees uh, is different on the Republican and Democratic side. And on our side, basically, you run one campaign to get in Congress, then you immediately have to start another campaign to go through what's called the Policy and Steering Committee to get on your committees of choice. You have to go around and meet with the old bulls, so-called, and, you know, ask for their blessing or their vote in this committee. And... Uh, you know, I got on public works, and after I got on public works, people say, oh, God, that's too bad. What, what committee did you want to get on? Uh, and I say, no, I really wanted to be on public works. And they say, you chose public works as your major committee? And I said, yes. And they said, oh, most other people don't want to be on public works. And I said, well, when you look at the problems uh, that are going to confront uh, this country uh, in the late uh, 1990s and into the next century, uh, there's one place uh, where we know there's at least going to be some funding uh, to deal with those problems, and that is in the area of public works because of the trust funded nature of the airport and airway uh, trust funds and uh, the uh, highway trust fund. And I'll, I'll get into a little bit later about the direction we're setting uh, for that highway trust fund uh, in the transportation bill, which is uh, uh, perhaps going to be settled uh, within uh, three or four days in a conference between the House and the Senate. Uh, you know, one of the things I have learned uh, as a member of that committee is that, uh, you know, when I go out and go around and begin to talk to people about uh, our decaying uh, transportation systems and our transportation infrastructure, uh, that uh, infrastructure uh, immediately becomes sort of a barrier uh, for folks. Uh, I've thought, spent a lot of time uh, trying to think of another word, uh, a word that perhaps is a little more attention grabbing. You, know, you bring up the word infrastructure, and a lot of times there's some shuffling in the room and people you know, looking at their watches. and. What happens in Congress is sort of our version of looking at watches in Congress, everybody carries these little index cards around in their pocket, and it's got your schedule for the day on it. So when, you know, if you're ever visiting with a member of Congress, you know you've lost their attention when they pull out the index card, and uh, they start looking at it. So, uh, you know, whenever I uh, often will launch into something about the importance of infrastructure, I'll see my colleagues pulling out their little blue index cards and looking to see where else they could be. Uh, but uh, it, it is, I think, and it getting uh, more and more recognition as the uh, concrete, mechanical, and steel uh, underpinning of our economy. Uh, it isn't just important uh, for physical structures, but more uh, for the quality, uh, for the role it plays in the quality of life of our cities. Uh, and also, and this is something that's often overlooked, uh, the productivity and profitability uh, of, our business, uh, of our businesses. And finally, the competitiveness and the standard of living of our nation vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Uh, you know, communities really don't tend to think about a lot about infrastructure until uh, major employers start moving away uh, and get uh, snatched up by other people offering uh, better roads, uh, water delivery, sewer systems. Uh, the media doesn't think much about it until uh, a bridge collapses and some cars uh, fall into the river 
and uh, that's often when it comes to public attention, maybe at the dedication of a new project, but mostly uh, only when there's a catastrophe. And nations uh, really only begin to care about infrastructure when uh, transportation costs, lost opportunities, and delays uh, begin to stifle productivity so much that we can no longer compete in the international marketplace and we can no longer ignore it. Uh, our nation is approaching that point. What I'm really here to talk about is that link uh, between the public investment in transportation and the potential uh, for economic growth and the future quality of life uh, in our country and our state. You know, in the, in the 1800s, the Erie Canal uh, captured great attention, um, as, as did for perhaps uh, for most of the people in the room, the whole idea of the uh, post-World War II interstate uh, highway system. Uh, that was something that people uh, got, got a lot of attention. Uh, in Oregon, uh, we owe our economic uh, lifeblood really to uh, our rail links, uh, Interstate 5, uh, the, uh, the feeder roads that bring uh, uh, from the markets uh, to our uh, major urban areas and uh, to be transshipped uh, to other states or overseas, uh, our rural roads, and, uh, and our ports, uh, the Port of Portland, uh, Astoria, Coos Bay, Newport, and the smaller ports and their commercial, imp <coughs> commercial importance. Uh, the Oregon Legislature uh, actually uh, recognized uh, the role uh, uh, quite some time ago, and they had a lot of foresight. Back in 1891, they created the Port of Portland and authorized uh, the Port of Portland to dredge the Columbia River uh, shipping channel to 25 feet. Uh, we're now engaged, and I'm working with the Port of Portland uh, to attempt to get uh, federal authorization and federal assistance uh, to uh, further uh, deepen the channel. Uh, to take us into uh, the, the late 20th and early 21st century in terms of the needs uh, of shipping, the draft that's required uh, for a new generation of ships. How bad, uh, how bad is it? What's the state of our nation's infrastructure? Well, the Army Corps of Engineers says 3,000 dams near populated areas in this country are hazardous. Uh, we, uh, uh, you know, Portland uh, itself has uh, been examining uh, the potential uh, shortage of water that might come uh, late in this decade or early in the, in the next decade uh, with projected growth. Uh, Springfield, where I live, uh, recently lost one of its main wells uh, to uh, industrial toxic pollution. Coos Bay has had its uh, development efforts stymied time and time again because they can't come up uh, with a dependable and adequate uh, supply of uh, clean water. Uh, we expect uh, there will be more than a billion dollars of unmet water and wastewater capital needs in our state, in our state alone, uh, between now and uh, the year 2000. And that figure uh, doesn't take into account uh, the projected uh, record growth uh, that we're now uh, undergoing again as we did uh, late in the last decade. Half the country's highways are substandard. Forty percent of our bridges are structurally, de structurally deficient or functionally obsolete. Uh, nationwide, the United States Department of Transportation estimates it would cost a mind-boggling 600 billion B billion dollars over the next two decades to bring all of our roads up to minimum engineering standards. Again, not really looking to the future, but just to maintain what we have now. In Oregon, 35 percent of our 2,500 bridges on the state system are considered deficient, and we're in uh, excellent shape uh, compared to states uh, further, uh, further east. Uh, the further east uh, you head, the higher the percentage is, up to some states in the 60s and low 70s. Uh, that's, that is a dreadful state of affairs. Uh, Oregon Department of Transportation has identified close to $600 million worth of needed improvements on I-5. Uh, over the next two decades, they estimate we'll have to spend $130 million right here just in Multnomah County. Uh, nationwide, spending on mass transit systems, which are essential uh, to reduce uh, urban congestion and smog, has decreased by 53 percent in the last decade. Doesn't make much sense in terms of uh, our dependence on foreign oil and transportation uses two-thirds uh, of the oil in this country. Uh, doesn't make much sense in terms of the quality of life we'd like to have for our urban areas. Uh, east side uh, light rail here is a great success story, but you know it exceeded ridership projections on the first day, and uh, ridership has increased every month for the last two years. And with Washington County and the growth and the demand out there, uh, we already expect that what we proposed uh, for West Side Light Rail, which uh, I think uh, will uh, withstand uh, the test of the House Senate conference and, and be funded uh, in this transportation bill, uh, we're already projecting that that's going to need uh, additional work and uh, maybe uh, have to be extended further. 
So we are growing as quickly as we begin to approach these problems because of the modest way, and I suppose I shouldn't say that $515 million of commitment by the Federal Government is modest uh, for West Side Light Rail. It isn't. Uh, but again, we aren't building some sort of luxurious optimal system that is projected to exceed all needs far into the next century. We are building something just to meet today's needs and maybe uh, take care of a little bit of the problems of tomorrow, but not resolve this problem uh, for our lifetimes and certainly not uh, for those who follow us. The, uh, around the world, <coughs> uh, our, uh, our competitors have been investing heavily, much more heavily than the United States in, uh, in infrastructure, uh, while we have been uh, systematically disinvesting. It is something I call uh, the third deficit. We have got, uh, as was mentioned uh, uh, by, uh, by the President uh, here, we have obviously the national deficit and the huge annual obligations to pay uh, our debt on, uh, uh, and our interest on that debt. Uh, the, uh, we have the international trade deficit. And finally, uh, in my mind, we have the third deficit, uh, which is the deficit in our nation's infrastructure. Uh, we have declined in terms of our investment to the point where I think it is as damaging to the future of our country as the, the uh, obligation to repay the over $3 trillion of national debt or the massive outflow of capital we are seeing with our international uh, trade deficit. You know, the, uh, when construction and uh, repair of roadways, airports, mass transit systems doesn't keep, uh, doesn't keep pace with increased use, the physical condition of our transportation system deteriorates. Uh, that causes uh, delays and costly repairs. Uh, when we defer maintenance, it leads to catastrophic failures, use, you know, shortened useful lives. And instead of spending thousands of dollars on bridge painting, we spend millions of dollars on major structural work and replacement. I, I guess it's a little bit human nature. You know, it's hard for me, even as a politician and a member of the Public Works Committee, to get real excited about going down and watching someone chip paint on the bridge. Uh, or even uh, announcing to the press that I've gotten more money to chip paint uh, on the Selwood Bridge and extend its uh, lifetime into the next century. But uh, obviously you can get a pretty good crowd and some cameras down there. If you go to cut a new ribbon uh, for a new bridge or uh, turn off the uh, first shovel of dirt for a new project. Uh, but that's, uh, that's something we're going to have to do is reorient our sites, both toward the improvements we need to meet the increases uh, in demands, but also to maintain what we have now. And, you know, as business people, and many of you are, you've got to wonder, well, you know, what does it mean to me? Well, the Federal Highway Administration has found that, uh, for instance, in operating a tractor trailer, when you pay your shipping costs, uh, you receive your goods, or you just go shopping locally, that uh, tractor trailer operation costs are 6.3 percent, 6.3 cents per mile higher on a road in fair condition than on one that's been recently resurfaced. Since a truck gets about five miles to a gallon of diesel, you do the math, that figures out to about 31 cents uh, per gallon of, uh, of an increase if we were to meet that need. If we were to bring those roads up to standard so you didn't have that loss, that would be the equivalent of a 31 cent uh, per gallon tax. So while, you know, when you got, uh, uh, it sounds great when you're running for office to have a no new taxes, read my lips kind of pledge. Uh, under, uh, under any conditions. It might sound great on the stump. It might even get you elected. Uh, but it may very well be a very costly mistake in terms of the future productivity uh, of our nation. And just for average drivers, for average uh, uh, people around Oregon and around the country, bad roads cost motorists in this country close to $20 billion in the last year. That's about $121 per driver in the cost of higher fuel consumption, extra repairs, uh, and increased tire wear. Uh, with the two tires I blew out on a pothole in Washington, uh, I, I exceeded the $121 average already. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's all too true. I mean, in Oregon, we're, we're relatively lucky, but uh, we've got problems if, if you look around and you look around carefully and you see the state surveys. So, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's impossible to, uh, you know, to even estimate beyond that what are the psychological costs of, uh, you know, being caught in traffic, someone trying to come in to, from 185th on the west side uh, down Sunset uh, to get here uh, to uh, make a morning appointment uh, to, uh, to conduct your business. And yet, uh, at a time when uh, infrastructure investment uh, has fallen off, as it has here, and these demands uh, are continuing to rise. Now, we're only beginning, I think, nationally to, to recognize the link uh, between infrastructure spending 
and the nation's productivity. Uh, we're beginning to talk about things that even go beyond infrastructure. Intermodal has been a big byword in this year's transportation bill. An integrated system of rail, highway, ports, airports. Uh, it helps uh, reduce bottlenecks in production and, dis and distribution. And uh, it makes possible what we've seen our competitors on the other side of the Pacific uh, uh, make uh, as a standard uh, for industry uh, in the late 20th century, which is just-in-time delivery. Uh, keeps costs down, makes you uh, more competitive uh, with uh, you know, your domestic competitors, and certainly makes you uh, more efficient and competitive uh, in international markets. Uh, convenient and affordable mass transit systems give workers more options and provide businesses access to a larger supply of uh, labor. There's an economist at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank in Chicago who documented how basically tracked peaks and valleys in investment uh, in infrastructure in this country, and he can dramatically demonstrate how closely productivity increases track those investments and those underpinnings by the federal government. Uh, back in the uh, 60s, uh, we had about 4 percent of our GNP dedicated, uh, particularly at the height of building the uh, national highway system in, uh, in the infrastructure investment. And we saw almost annual 4 percent increases uh, in productivity in the GNP. And now, uh, in the last decade, uh, because of the huge military buildup and the diversion of funds and other reasons, uh, we have seen uh, infrastructure investment plummet to a low of less than 2 percent, and we've seen productivity drop uh, down to 1.4. Now, now, that's not the entire reason for the decrease in productivity, but Ashour says that you can pretty reliably attribute about half of that decrease in productivity to uh, the declining infrastructure, to the things I mentioned earlier, the delays and, and the other problems that are caused. He estimates that our, our GNP would receive a $4 return for every dollar invested in infrastructure. According to one study, a program of increased transportation spending of $10 billion a year for 10 years, $10 billion a year, that's probably with cost overruns, 5B2 bombers, uh, for 10 years would result in a productivity increase of more than $900 billion for our nation over 10 years. Uh, last fall, in Congress, uh, when we uh, got through the so-called budget summit agreement, we had actually raised half of that money. The federal gas tax went up by five cents last fall. But instead of investing it here, where we could have seen, if we just take his number in half, a $450 billion increase in productivity uh, over uh, the next decade into the, into the beginning of the next century, that money was diverted uh, into uh, additional increments for the trust fund and into deficit reduction for the first time uh, in the history uh, of the country. We have reliably and generally assessed fuel cost uh, taxes and used those only uh, as dedicated funds, but some of this money was diverted. If you go to mass transit, the benefits are even greater. Uh, West Side Light Rail will create about 4,000 direct and indirect jobs in, in the area, and uh, the total economic impact is estimated to be about $2 billion by the end of the decade. Uh, down in my uh, district, there's an example uh, down in Roseburg. Uh, they, they had a parcel of property. They wanted to get some new business on it. And uh, uh, Alcan uh, Aluminum Company, uh, Bayliner Boats, and Warehouser were looking at that, all looking at their parcel, but it didn't have good access to I-5. It was underserved in terms of a feeder road and uh, on a water line. Well, uh, in partnership with the state, uh, ODOT, and uh, the, uh, the state and the county uh, put together the money to provide that access, to provide that interchange. And uh, we got three new employers, three new businesses in Douglas County, the most uh, timber dependent uh, community in the state. Uh, means something like 500 good, stable, long term non timber jobs in the Douglas County area. That's certainly an investment uh, that will be paid back many, many times over uh, to the state and the local government. Every business owner understands uh, the importance of investment. Without investments in new equipment, or plant space, a business can quickly fall behind its competitors, and the same is true of nations. Ask a business person uh, whose uh, truck drivers waste hundreds of hours each year on bad roads that are over capacity, one who can't get adequate volumes of good quality water. What's the true cost of neglected and inadequate infrastructure? When it comes to time, to total profits and losses, the challenge of competition, uh, a similar company with a similar company down the road that doesn't have those constraints. The same is true for nations. Most of our economic competitors understand that. Infrastructure spending is more than just potholes. It's more than even spectacular projects like light rail 
or bridges its competitiveness. The government of Taiwan realizes this perhaps better than anybody. They have just announced three weeks ago that they will spend $300 billion, the small country of Taiwan, 16 million people, $300 billion on railroads, highways, and subways and water treatment plants in the next six years. That far exceeds the investment the United States of America is programming for a nation of 270 million people. Japan spends three times what we do as a percentage of GNP. Look at our other competitors, uh, uh, Germany and others. We are running huge trade deficits with all these countries, and part of the reason is that we have not kept up with them in terms of our productivity and our productivity particularly as it relates uh, to our infrastructure. Transportation economists project our economy will foregone increases of about 3.2 percent in gross national product, 6 percent disposable income, 2.2 percent in employment, and 2.7 percent in manufacturing and productivity by the end of the century if we fail to make these investments. By doing nothing, we are squandering a greater and greater uh, part of our wealth, uh, our heritage, our birthright, and uh, we're falling further and further behind. So it's time for change in the priorities of this country, I believe, a dramatic change, so that America can ready herself for the global competition of the next century. And the, the competition of the next century is not going to be military. We won that. That's over. The competition now for world leadership has already begun. It began years ago. It's now economic. First, uh, we've got to get this highway transportation infrastructure bill through. As I said, we are uh, on the cusp of an agreement with the Senate. Um, my hope is the President uh, will be able to accept uh, what we're proposing. It's dramatically different than what the President proposed. The President has derided the Congress because we failed to meet his 100-day deadline to map out the transportation infrastructure future of this country for the next five years. Now, I guess I don't blame a guy who measures his, uh, uh, his golf in terms of how long it takes him to play instead of what his score was to, uh, you know, to look at Congress and say, produce something in 100 days. Uh, you know, but that is not good policy. And when you think of all the things we've just uh, discussed here, uh, it's certainly as important as this is to our nation. I'd rather take 110 days or even 200 days to come up with a plan that's going to meet these needs. The President's plan would have put much more burden on states like Oregon. It would have required us to double our local match to get the West Side Light Rail project. And uh, in the measure, uh, measure 5 atmosphere here in Oregon, I don't know where we would have been able to double our commitment. It would have required us to double our commitment uh, to deal with the, uh, with the I-5 and, and bridge uh, projects. The House bill uh, provides uh, a 80-20 match, uh, much, much uh, more affordable match for states like Oregon. Uh, the House bill doubles the amount of federal investment in, uh, in mass transit spending. Uh, the House bill would spend another uh, $25 billion on uh, bringing current roads, bridges uh, up to standards. And we do all this without creating a penny of deficit. Uh, it's all uh, within the capabilities of the current trust fund and the current level of taxation on fuel. Uh, so uh, you know, we have a tremendous opportunity here to move the country forward, a giant leap, uh, with, an, with no new taxes, with no new deficit. And in fact, I would posit that it will do tremendous things uh, to reduce our current, our current deficit. I mentioned before, uh, in closing the, uh, the competition in the next century, that it will be economic uh, and not military. Uh, you know, there's another place where we can turn uh, to rebuild the infrastructure of this country, because I've, I've pretty much concentrated on highways, roads, bridges, mass transit. There are tremendous uh, other needs. Uh, look uh, out on the east side of Portland and the controversy about funding of sewers, uh, the problems we have with water quality. Uh, there, is, uh, there is another deficit in infrastructure that needs to be met. And I would posit that uh, we can do that, too. And we can do that with the peace dividend. Thus far, the peace dividend has been a little bit elusive, but let me tell you, it's there. We spent $300 billion on the military a couple of years ago, and now we find out that the estimates of what the Soviets were spending were always kind of inflated or phony, if you want to be less charitable about what Mr. Gates did. And uh, you now take and look at that, and the Cold War is over, and we're still spending $300 billion. We're still spending $160 billion to defend NATO against the Warsaw Pact. Well, the Warsaw Pact doesn't exist anymore, but we're still spending it. 
We're still spending about $50 billion uh, in, uh, in the Asian area to defend Japan uh, against aggressor nations. Uh, we're, we're looking at Star Wars. We're looking at the B-2 bomber, a bomber that was supposed to be invisible. It isn't. It'll cost more than a billion dollars each, uh, but uh, we're still fighting with the president. He still wants, he still wants, to, uh, he still wants to build them. So I propose a program where, with the peace dividend and their very credible plans, a number of which I support, to reduce our spending on the military over the next five years by 50 percent and take one-third of those savings and put it into deficit reduction and begin to deal with the tremendous burden of debt on this country and the annual obligations to pay interest on the debt of this country. Invest one-third in infrastructure. What would do more to lift this economy out of the economic doldrums, out of the recession, than a massive public works program, something that isn't just a one-year make-work job, but something that increases the capital stock of our nation and increases our productivity, increases our international ability to compete, and finally take the other one-third and reinvest it in human capital, something that has been sadly neglected uh, in this country. If you look at the cost of college education, you look at uh, what's happened uh, uh, in health care and other areas, there are tremendous unmet needs. I posit if we spent the money in these ways, uh, it would be a wise investment. It would help us begin to work our way out of the hole we've dug ourselves into. And if we do these things, I believe that in the next century, we won't be looking at the history books and thinking back longingly to the American century, which was 1900 to 1999. We'll be living in the next American century, the 21st century, where America will again uh, be the free world and the world leader in economic, uh, industrial, and uh, social uh, competition around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman DeFazio. Um, we now open the, the uh, meeting up to questions. The first question will be asked by board host Ross Simmons. And although I'm sure you would welcome questions on transportation today, uh, would you be Anything? willing to answer others as well? I, I hope so. Ross, the uh, first question is yours. I always refer to these sessions as stump the congressman when I get this part in. <laughs> you get a special star if you manage to ask me something I can't answer or won't. Well, I'll try. Um, in, in view of the, the, the shortage of resources to, to fund infrastructure maintenance improvements, uh, what role do you think land use planning should play in uh, concentrating development in uh, uh, smaller areas so that those, those monies can be spent in a, a concentrated and more effective way? And what role should the federal government play in fostering that kind of a, an approach to uh, make an efficient use of the federal money spent on that, uh, those types of expenditures? This was, in fact, controversy uh, in developing uh, the uh, transportation infrastructure legislation. I brought the Public Works uh, Committee uh, here to Portland uh, not too long ago. Uh, a number of you were there uh, through our session. And a major portion of the presentation uh, to the Public Works Committee, something that they were most interested in and something they still talk to me about, was what we've done with our metropolitan planning efforts in the Portland area and around the state of Oregon how wise it was to develop transportation corridors, how much money that would save. You know, in, in other uh, parts of the country, the biggest portion of cost uh, to develop a new transit system is to obtain the right-of-way. The biggest controversy is in terms of uh, dispossessing businesses or individuals in order to develop that transportation right-of-way. Uh, we have integrated that into our planning process. It saves us a tremendous, and will save us into the future, a tremendous amount of money uh, to have that goal. The federal government's role, uh, we're not going to ever see national land use planning. I wouldn't advocate that. I, uh, you know, land use planning, having been the chair of the board of the Lane County Commissioners in Lane County when we did our, our plan, I've received a lot more death threats uh, because of that than being a member of Congress, as unpopular as it is to be a member of Congress these days. Uh, but uh, uh, what the federal government should do is encourage those efforts, and we're doing it with a carrot in this bill, and that is we are going to provide uh, more money to states to do this sort of uh, planning for transportation infrastructure, to recognize uh, in particular uh, areas like Portland that has a metropolitan effort. Uh, we're going to require all the states 
if uh, in the future to uh, in order to remain and retain their eligibility uh, for the full range of federal funds, particularly some of the uh, the discretionary programs, to develop uh, such uh, such plans. And I think it'll it'll be paid back many many times over. If you just go back to D.C. and look at Virginia, you want to look at a mess. You want to look at the next L.A. in the making. It's Northern Virginia. Uh, the incredible amount of development that's gone out there with no thought, no thought at all for the infrastructure. It's not unusual for people to live 15 miles out and take an hour and a half to get into Washington, D.C. now uh, at rush hour in the morning. And now they had an article in the paper recently about weekends where they said people don't go out on weekends anymore because the traffic actually reaches higher peaks on weekends. And in Virginia, people get frustrated when they just want to get down to the, uh, down to the store and it takes an hour and a half to get there, an hour and a half to get back. Uh, so it's, it's, it's becoming a big drag on, on that economy, and uh, it's something that, that could have been avoided and could be substantially avoided in terms of getting worse with planning. Key role. I'm Brian Campbell, um, a member of the City Club. Uh, you kind of stolen some of my uh, thunder here. Um, I was going to ask a very similar kind of question. I guess in following up on that a little bit, um, I understand that there are uh, different formulas for allocating uh, funds to the states in terms of the overall uh, Service Transportation Act. And I was wondering if you could comment on those. Um, is the, is the uh, bill going to uh, work on a uh, vehicle miles traveled basis or, uh, uh, or reward uh, states with high fuel consumption, or are you going to go to a different kind of uh, uh, formula for that? Uh, you, you know, you put uh, your finger on what is often the key contention in many bills in Congress, which is, okay, everyone agrees on the principle, now let's talk about whose, uh, whose ox gets gored here. And uh, that's when you come down to these formulas. I have argued very strenuously that we should not have a consumption-oriented bill. We should not have a bill that rewards inefficiency, that returns more money uh, to states uh, that have higher uh, per capita fuel consumption, as opposed to states like ours, which are attempting to plan and conserve. In fact, I argue the opposite. There should be special allocations to states that can show they have decreased uh, their consumption on a per capita basis, and they should, uh, they should be rewarded for those efforts. The administration is on the rewarding consumption side. I'm on the rewarding efficiency and conservation side. The battle is not yet uh, complete. That's a, a big issue in the conference. That will be, I'm sure, a major bone of contention. I believe that Congress will put forward a bill which is more oriented toward uh, conservation and efficiency. Uh, it'll be a question of whether or not the president can accept that when it gets uh, when it gets to his desk. Uh, there, I'm certain, will be other controversies, but that will be a major controversy with it, with his administration. My name is Gilbert Lamb, City Club member. For the benefit of the audience, I will preface my question with a couple short remarks. It must be evident to you that the large trucks and trailers, which are often 100 to 150 feet or more in length, are showing up in increasing numbers and are taking much business away from the railroads. These railroads are required to buy and own almost all the railroad right-of-way land and then level said right-of-way to a gradual slope up or down by building trestles and making excavations, and then pay property tax on said land, plus the cost of improvements of laying the ties approximately every two feet on which the rails are fastened. My question is, are we not subsidizing the trucks too much, especially when highway congestion would be lessened while railroad congestion is almost non-existent? Well, Oregon has one of the uh, most progressive, it's been looked at as a model nationally, uh, systems of taxing uh, trucks in terms of weight miles. In fact, uh, there were people who proposed from the trucking industry side in the bill to restrict the ability of states like Oregon to raise uh, revenue that way. But even in Oregon, where we have one of the most progressive systems, trucks are not paying the full cost of the damage they cause uh, to the highway system in our state and uh, certainly not in other parts of the nation. So to answer your question, we are subsidizing uh, that industry uh, already. And uh, in the bill, we had uh, a major controversy over the issue of uh, what we call longer combination vehicles, whether it's a Rocky Mountain Double, a Triple, or whatever. And the best we were able to do, and this is a lot better than I thought when we started, I figured when we started uh, the trucking industry has rolled uh, the rail industry and the other folks uh, uh, in past bills. The, uh, the uh, rail industry was able to form a coalition with consumers, with average drivers, with the AAA, 
and others with environmentalists, people concerned about congestion, fuel consumption and efficiency because the rails uh, for the most part are inherently more efficient. And we were able to adopt a, a, a bill that prohibited the further expansion of longer combination vehicles to any other states than the 13 that have already allowed them, required a review of whether those 13 states had legally allowed uh, LCVs. In Oregon, we probably are, have because we've had them for quite some time. Uh, but we also allowed the states uh, to eliminate them. The industry wanted to have a mandate that states would have to stay where they were now. We rejected that. We beat that. So we've basically left it up to those 13 states, and as you probably know, Senator McCoy and others uh, are going to offer a referendum in the state of Oregon to roll back uh, the, truck, uh, the truck size, uh, and they hope to get it on the ballot for 1992. I'm Ray Polanyi, a City Club member. Uh, Congressman DeFazio, we, uh, we really feel that we should commend you for uh, taking a, uh, a good look at what the situation is. And we agree with you that uh, it, it's miserable as far as transportation is concerned. Um, uh, let, me, let me ask uh, perhaps this. Uh, you mentioned some $600 billion that the Department of Transportation says is going to be the cost of upgrading our, our highway structure and bridges over the next uh, 20 years or so. Uh, yet we know that uh, in all three uh, contributing factors in productivity, uh, capital, labor and energy, rails can do much better than highways. Uh, somehow or other, though, uh, the rails are not being considered in this big package uh, because they're in private ownership, though I guess our, we have a, a public rail passenger service, Amtrak, such as it is. Um, what is the likelihood that uh, in, in the new transportation bill and in the future, uh, the the government will provide some sort of subsidy, perhaps one-tenth of what the $600 billion would be, let's say $60 billion, to rails, rail infrastructure, and transit. Uh, what would that do? You mentioned our competitiveness position. Mm -hmm. It seems that every other country in the world is investing uh, tremendously in rail and uh, in, in public transit. I think we better do it if we want to be competitive. What, what is the likelihood that, that our well, government will do it? In this bill, uh, we did double spending on public transit. Uh, we don't, the Congress has strange ways, and we do not on Public Works Committee uh, have jurisdiction over rail. Uh, it was stolen from the Public Works Committee, or shall we say, <clears throat> it was apportioned to uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee of, of uh, Mr. Dingell. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a shame, I think, because if you're going to talk about a nationally integrated system, I do not believe that you can neglect rail. And I would include rail in my proposal for the one-third of the uh, infrastructure rebuilding that we would glean from the, uh, from the peace dividend. I would include rail in that. I think it's in the interest of this country to have high-speed rail corridors, uh, particularly for passengers in the, in the uh, metropolitan areas, uh, that are, it, it, it would be less expensive than many of the other things that we could do. And also, I, I would look at rail for longer distances and fuel efficiency. If we were ever going to move toward that day when we import less oil and we're less enthralled of the Middle East, it's got to come with dramatic increases in efficiency. And I don't see that we're able to accomplish those dramatic increases uh, through trucks. Rail is the most uh, energy efficient form uh, of transit uh, for, those, for those heavy loads over long distances. Yes, sir. Isaac Regan's Drive Club member. Uh, what are the prospects, Congressman, for in future increases in gas tax? Well, uh, right now I would say that uh, they are non-existent. Uh, we proposed in putting forward this highway bill uh, what uh, Chairman Rowe called a nickel for America, and that would be to uh, increase the gas tax for nickel solely get it dedicated back into the uh, transportation in infrastructure of the country. Uh, immediately, uh, other people began looking at that. Well, let's just take a little bit for deficit reduction. The administration said, no, you know, we, we won't support it at all. Uh, so what we did to fund the bill was the, uh, the tax was increased by a nickel last fall. Two and a half cents of that is going into the Highway Trust Fund, but it remains unspent by law until 1995. Two and a half cents goes to deficit reduction. What we said is that starting in 1995, we will spend down those trust funds. There will be by then over a $20 billion accumulated balance on the trust fund. We mandate that in this bill. And secondly, 
we will uh, continue that two and a half cents, which was to expire in 1995, into the indefinite futures. So uh, at this point, uh, what you're actually going to see in 1995 is a decrease in the federal gas tax, but more money dedicated back into the transportation infrastructure from the gas tax at that point in time. For my mind, I would have done it a lot sooner. I would have done it last fall. I'd do it today uh, in terms of not diverting that money into the general fund, not impounding those trust funds, likewise with the airport and airway trust fund, but uh, we did not have uh, a two-thirds vote in the House uh, nor the Senate uh, to, uh, to overcome the President on his objections to that. Secretary Skinner is very firm about uh, maintaining huge unspent balances in those funds and uh, the President uh, backs him up and uh, we, we have been unable to get a two-thirds vote on anything, let alone something uh, like that. So. Ted Kaye, City Club member. You mentioned the key role that federal funding plays in the West Side Light Rail Project. What are the remaining hurdles at the federal level that the West Side Light Rail Project must overcome? Well, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, at this point, uh, unless something unexpected which is always possible, happens in the, uh, in the conference over the next week or so, or the conference falls apart, uh, which is also possible, because uh, there were dramatic differences between the House and the Senate, but I think we're getting those resolved. Or the President vetoes the bill. Uh, the first bill I got to vote on when I came to Congress was the uh, last five-year reauthorization, which had been vetoed by President Reagan uh, for uh, transportation infrastructure. And uh, President Bush has made noises that he will veto this one because there's a tax increase. Well, actually, it's not a tax increase. What we do is we extend the two and a half cents beyond 1995, which actually, as I said to him, is a two and a half cent decrease starting in 95. But the president is looking around furiously for something to get his tax credentials back on. So he has threatened to veto the bill because of that. Uh, there are other differences. Uh, he has threatened to veto the bill because of the increase in funding for mass transit. Uh, so we may yet come to a confrontation over these issues. But if uh, both in both the House and the Senate version, West Side Light Rail is totally accommodated in the uh, in the five year in the five year bill, so I feel reasonably comfortable at this point in time that uh, we will not have uh, we will not have any problems. As comfortable as you can feel about anything in Washington these days. Yes, Jim Bashi, City Club member. A as Oregonians, we are used to paying tolls for bridges. We do not pay tolls on roads. I know in other areas of the country they have toll turnpikes. And it seems it might be an equitable revenue generator because it's based on a user fee. Now, as far as the national situation is concerned, has your committee considered this? What are the pros and cons to that system? Well, the early days of this country, uh, we had virtually all uh, toll roads, toll bridges, toll ferries. Uh, and it was something that uh, we rejected in terms of having an integrated national transportation system, and we moved away from it most dramatically, starting with uh, President Eisenhower and what was called then the National Defense Highway System. Uh, and that was really uh, when the federal government began investing more and more and more money, uh, you saw you know, fewer and fewer toll roads. As the federal investment has not kept up, states are looking at uh, toll roads again. And in fact, this highway bill would permit states, uh, if they so choose, to go forward. Uh, previous uh, federal law would, uh, would penalize them. Uh, this bill would allow uh, states to go forward with toll road projects uh, without penalty uh, in terms of their other, their other federal funds uh, in the future. Uh, they just couldn't convert uh, previously funded federal projects or future funded federal projects into toll roads. Uh, if they build something with state funds in Virginia, they're actually going to build an extension of the Dulles Road with private, uh, private money. First time in, I think, about 100 years uh, that there'll be a private funded uh, transportation uh, system. I, I, I'm a little concerned about that. I mean, you can get into a fairly fragmented sort of thing if, if you remove this uh, from the realm of uh, uh, I think of, of government and uh, begin uh, to look at just what would be your high revenue quarters. On the other hand, dealing with, say, L.A., San Diego in terms of the rail, probably long before I'm able to get any federal money, there will probably be some private consortium that will put together a high-speed rail link because the money's there. The pri it can, you can pencil it out. So uh, we left the door open uh, to uh, toll experimentation for any state that, uh, that so wishes. <coughs> Jim Nelson, uh, member. Uh, the Motor Carrier Act of 1935 was put in for a reason, at least perceived at that time, to avoid such things as cutthroat competition, preferential treatment of major shippers, uh, safety problems, 
uh, lack of service to small communities. Uh, there is a, a list as, as long as my arm that, through the amendment period. Now we have deregulation and we've got bigger trucks. I don't know if they're caused by it. We have um, problems of buyouts, some buyouts uh, admittedly to cut competition. Do you have any idea whether deregulation has helped or hurt this country? Uh, I would say that uh, we were a bit overregulated and we lurched too far in the other direction to what I would call radical deregulation. Uh, I'm more of an expert since the Motor Carrier Act is not under my committee jurisdiction. Again, it's in energy and commerce. I'm more familiar with the airlines in terms of the deregulation that took place there. And uh, what I have said regularly, and I said to Ms. Dole when she was Secretary of Transportation, I've said to Mr. Skinner is, you know, there was a certain public interest in, in some freeing up of the bureaucratic shackles here. But uh, when you look now, they, they say it's been a tremendous success. Even Carl Icahn is saying that apparently it wasn't a success. It went too far uh, as we're headed toward three airlines in America. Uh, Sam Skinner says if you have two, you have effective competition. Well, fly. I, he said that for our committee. I mean, and, and you fly into St. Louis where, yeah, you've got even three, but one has 85 percent of the gates. And if you think that's effective competition, look at the comparison in distance, uh, what you have to pay for a ticket out of St. Louis versus uh, uh, some of, you know, on, on comparable routes elsewhere because of that dominance. So we are looking at a, uh, in terms of where we have jurisdiction, we are looking at a competitiveness bill uh, which would, in fact, uh, reclaim some of the federal role in uh, federal aviation, particularly the things that we see as most legitimate to the government, which is governing airspace and landing rights at uh, congested airports. The government has been giving those things away for free. Uh, airlines then have been selling them for huge amounts of money. Uh, and there's no return to the public, and then we go to the public and say, well, now you've got to pay for a new uh, airport here, or you've got to pay for a new air traffic control system here, uh, and yet the airlines have been granted these rights, and then they, these become fungible assets for them, and there's no auction, there's no competition, uh, and the biggest airlines can obviously afford to gobble up the most of the, the landing rights and the gates at the congested airports. So we're looking at a bill that would, uh, would reinstill uh, some competition through regulation of gates and uh, some other things that would do that. Uh, I, I'm not anywhere near uh, as conversant with motor carriers because, again, it's not in my jurisdiction, but my observation is, as an Oregonian, uh, that it has created a lot of problems for states like Oregon. I don't know if it's worked out better elsewhere, but in terms of service uh, for the, uh, the rural uh, parts of our state and the costs, uh, from what I hear from people, uh, have gone up dramatically, and we've seen a number of our major carriers bought up or go bankrupt because of, I think, some predatory practices uh, by other lines. So I, I think that's also an area that should be looked at in terms of, uh, in terms of the trucking. Uh, I don't want to go back to the, the days when every single route is set by some bureaucrat somewhere and there's no deviation and there's no reasonableness. On the other hand, I think there's a point in between those two uh, with, some, with some public interest regulation that most people would support. And if you look at the history of this country, we've sort of gone through, this is about the third time we've gone through a phase of radical deregulation, which is usually followed by uh, dramatic re-regulation. I'd like to sort of cut the tops off those, those curves and kind of come back up to here and go out like that into the future and have a little bit of stability. The other, okay. Got one. I really wasn't going to read this. I was going to send it forward um, because I, it's kind of uh, a, an uncomfortable one. Uh, Congressman DeFazio, uh, my name's Andrew Wheeler, a member. One reason we heard for not moving I-5 east on the east side of the river and gaining 21 acres of property there was that such a move would put the west side light rail funding in jeopardy. Incidentally, we're spending a huge amount to put light rail underground on the west side. Uh, what do you think about our priorities and are we planning well? Well, you get the gold star for stumping uh, the congressman. It's not that I don't want to answer the question. I, I've got to tell you, I try and keep up with a lot of things, but, uh, and I've met with people associated with light rail a number of times, but there's someone here probably more qualified than me. I saw Tom Walsh earlier to uh, address some of those issues. Uh, I do not know of that issue, I'm going to tell you honestly. I, it has not been raised to me previously. I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of it. Uh, I'm, that's just an honest answer. I'm, my objective has been fighting over 
ifs, ands, or buts in the paragraph that authorizes West Side Light Rail and fighting over the share that we get from the federal government. And I've, I've pretty much, uh, in my mind, left all of the planning and uh, everything else that goes with it to the agencies of local jurisdiction. And I am assuming that given the good open government processes we have here in Oregon, it's been honestly arrived at and it's a feasible project. Uh, I could be wrong. Uh, and I'm always open to hear from people, but uh, I re that's really uh, up to the local jurisdiction to, to make those determinations. And I'm not aware of the, the I-5 issue at all. So, that. thank you very much. I appreciate it. Enjoyed it. We have a bit more time remaining, and I was sort of hoping Congressman DeFazio would, would answer the question that he'd wish he'd been asked, but I don't know what that question is. Uh, if the Sermon on the Mount were delivered today, I think one of the sentences in it might be, blessed are they who toil responsibly in obscure congressional committees, for they shall make a difference. Congressman DeFazio, thank you again for speaking to us today, and we are adjourned. <laughs>